Hi, everyone. Um, so this is going to be an hour long presentation by um, Professor Tom Patterson, um, and he is the Bradley Professor of Government and the Press. Um, and he is here at the Shorenstein Center, um, and I will let him take it away now. So <clears throat> I wish I was at the Shorenstein Center. I'm at home, actually, today. and. Um... We're having a little bit of internet issues in the neighborhood. They're doing some work on the internet. So if I suddenly disappear, uh, uh, that's either a godsend or some reason for despair. So, but I will be back. Uh, it takes me about 10 seconds to back, be back on. So I wanna talk about the 2022 midterms, um, but um, I don't wanna focus exclusively on uh, what's happening now. Uh, I want to talk first about some of the tendencies uh, that we see in midterm elections, uh, reasons for those tendencies, and then whether there's some features uh, this year uh, that are likely to reinforce the normal tendencies uh, or maybe disrupt them. So this will be familiar. You may not have seen this chart before, but you've certainly heard uh, the statement before. Um, you know, in the midterm, you love to be the out party. Uh, this is the pattern over the last century. We've had 25 midterms um, uh, during that period of time. And the red bar uh, is the number of seats that the House out party has picked up in those midterms. And as you can see, there are only three out of the 25 midterms in that period uh, where the uh, in party uh, has been able to win seats. So that's the normal tendency uh, on the House side. Um, it also occurs on the Senate side, uh, but it's a bit less pronounced. Uh, and I think this is just uh, a question of numbers. So we have 435 contests uh, for the House. Uh, kind of statistics really kick in when you have that number, uh, but we only contest a third of the Senate seats uh, in each midterm. And so uh, it's more often the case that the end party will pick up a few seats, but. Again, you see the tendency. Uh, ordinarily, uh, this is something that the out party looks forward to. Now, in th terms of thinking about why that's the case, um, there are two theories uh, that political scientists have developed uh, to explain the tendency. Uh, one is called surge and decline, uh, and the other is called the referendum theory. So here's the idea behind surge and decline. So, as you know, we get have more voters uh, turn out in a presidential election. That's the surge. Uh, it occurs every four years. Um, and it's also the case that those extra voters that turn out in presidential elections, but not in midterms, uh, are a little more subject to the mood of the moment. Uh, they tend to be somewhat less partisan. Uh, they're more interested in kind of the issues and swayed by whatever the mood happens to be. Uh, that helps the winning presidential candidate get over the line, um, but it also works down ballot. It helps the uh, congressional candidates of that party uh, win in close races. But then you come to the midterm two years later, uh, and those voters vanish. Uh, uh, they don't show up, um, and that erases that that advantage that uh, the end party had during the uh, during the presidential year. And <clears throat> here's it visually. Um, so. You know, in terms of thinking about the size of the electorate, uh, the midterm electorate is only about 70% of the size of the presidential electorate. Um, it tends to be more partisan, uh, less influenced by the issues, the mood of the moment. And then when you look at those extra voters, those that show up only in the presidential election, they're less partisan, more influenced. And again, that's, that's behind this idea of surge and decline is an explanation for why the out party does well. And this will give you a sense of um, the nature of the surge. So what I've done here in this chart is to show you um, among what I would call the swing voters. Uh, and these are the voters that show up only in the presidential year. Here's the advantage that in each of those elections, the winning candidate had. Uh, and you can see that ordinarily uh, that the extra voters that show up come in mostly on the side of the winner. Uh, and we only have two exceptions to that in this period from 1988 to 2020. Um, one of those elections is uh, the 2004 election. It split almost 50-50, and then also in 2012. But ordinarily, 
those voters come in on the side of the presidential candidate who wins, uh, also helps in the down ballot, but then you take them out of the electorate uh, two years later. And that's where the penalty comes in. So uh, when that surge vote disappears, uh, and again, it carried over the line, some of the party's uh, congressional candidates in the presidential year, uh, but now they're vulnerable. Um, and uh, the bigger the surge, the more that you kind of win that extra set of voters that come into the presidential election, uh, uh, the bigger penalty you're gonna pay uh, two years later, uh, because a lot of your candidates will have gotten a boost uh, and they're gonna be vulnerable uh, when the midterm comes around. Um, and I use that, uh, put it into a regression equation to indicate uh, kind of what would be the expectation for Republicans this time. Uh, Biden actually did very well uh, with those uh, voters that uh, only play in presidential politics in 2020. Uh, but again, kind of the more of, of an advantage you have there, the bigger penalty you're going to pay in the midterm. Uh, and it comes out to roughly uh, a 25 Republican seat gain. Uh, would be the prediction from surge and decline. Now, the other theory is the referendum theory of midterm elections. Uh, and this is the idea that the most popular you're going to be as president of the United States is when you walk into the office on the first day. Uh, then you start to make decisions. Uh, you start to make some people angry. You also, at some point in that first year, you inherit the problems that are out there. Uh, they might have been a drag on the previous administration, but if the economy isn't going well, suddenly you're the owner uh, of that bad economy. Uh, and this drags down uh, the president's approval rating. Uh, and that weakens, this is the theory, that weakens the uh, appeal of the president's party uh, when you come to the midterm elections. And you can see here, and what I've done in this chart is to show you um, uh, president's average approval rating in their first year in office compared to their second year in office. And as you can see, uh, there are only two exceptions uh, uh, to that pattern of presidents losing uh, approval uh, by simply by being in office from year one to year two. And then if you look at those two exceptions, uh, you can kind of understand you know, why they might have been more popular in year two than in year one. Uh, the first is George H.W. Bush. Well, what happened in Bush's, uh, that Bush's first year in office. Uh, well, the Soviet Union collapses. Uh, Eastern Europe, the, the Berlin, uh, the wall comes down in Berlin. Uh, it was a time of pretty good news. Uh, and George H.W. was uh, more popular in his second year than he was in his first year in office. The other exception is George W. Uh, and of course, in his first year, we had the terrorist attacks of 9-11 uh, and the um, invasion of Afghanistan, which at least in the first instance was quite popular. So he also was more popular in the uh, in the second year than the first, but that's unusual. Usually presidents lose popularity. Um, and Biden is no exception to the general pattern. Uh, uh, he's down about 11 points uh, on average this year from what he was in his first year in office. Now, <clears throat> what I've done is here in this chart is to show you how that kind of translates. The less popular the president, uh, the more difficulty the in-party has in the congressional election in terms of the share of the congressional vote. So you can see as the uh, president's popularity is, is down on the lower end, uh, the 35 on the horizontal bar, uh, the out-party does better. And then of course, the more popular the president is in the second year, uh, the in-party uh, does relatively better. Uh, so where do we put uh, Biden on this chart? Well, he's right here. Uh, and uh, that would predict that uh, if you look at the national vote for the House, uh, uh, that Republicans should win it about 52 to 48. Again, this is based on the referendum theory. This has nothing to do with polls. This is all about that theory, the referendum theory of midterm elections. Uh, well, if you get out polled 52 to 48 in the national congressional vote, uh, what's that predict in terms of the loss of House seats for the end party? Uh, well, it turns out that it's about the same as the uh, surge and decline theory, uh, that the Democrats by this theory would be predicted to lose 21 House seats. So 
Here's another indicator of that referendum theory. So we've had eight midterms since World War II. Uh, 2022 will be the ninth, uh, where the president's approval rating has been below 50%. Uh, and in every one of those elections, the end party has lost House seats. Uh, and uh, they, uh, it's been 26 seats or more in every case except one. And that was 2014, uh, when the Democrats lost only uh, 13 seats in the House. So the question is, uh, is there anything unusual about 2022? Is there any reason to expect that the Democrats might be do better than either the surge in decline or the referendum theory would predict? Um, well, there is something unusual about this election. So if it's a render, referendum on the incumbent president, uh, Joe Biden, it also happens to be a referendum uh, on elements of the out party. Um, so, Donald Trump is not on the ballot, nor is Joe Biden. But uh, like Biden, Trump hovers over the ballot this time uh, in an unusual way for uh, a former president. Uh, usually when a president leaves office, uh, they don't dig in deeply uh, in, in election politics. But Trump's been all over the place, uh, endorsing candidates, campaigning for him in this campaign. He's very much a part of this campaign in a way that former presidents uh, have not been. Um, and uh, and of course, we've had the January 6th uh, House committee hearings. Uh, that's kept uh, Trump uh, as an element of this election. And then, of course, in late June, we have the Supreme Court and the Dobbs decision. Uh, and the perception by many, uh, actually, it's a little over 50 percent, that the uh, Supreme Court is pursuing a partisan conservative agenda. So Biden's on the ballot in a way. So is Trump. So is the Supreme Court. Uh, and what's interesting is that none of these uh, actors are popular uh, on average with the, uh, with the uh, electorate. So that's again, Biden's approval rating. He's down there about 42% approval, 52% disapprove, but that's roughly where Trump is. Uh, and the Supreme Court even a bit lower. So if Biden's a drag on Democratic candidates, then we have to think that Trump uh, and the Supreme Court are also a drag, but in this case, on Republican candidates. Um, and another way is simply to look at the polls. Uh, so this is not a theory. This is just simply doing the polls. Uh, and here's the chart uh, over uh, most of this year uh, in terms of when pollsters go out and they ask a generic uh, ballot question. If the election were held today, um, uh, would you vote for the Republican candidate for Congress or the Democratic candidate. And that's what you're looking at. Uh, and as you can see earlier in the year, Republicans had a kind of a nice lead on Democrats, 53-47 uh, in terms of the generic ballot. But it's tightened considerably since then. Uh, and uh, at the moment, and this is yesterday's polls, uh, uh, the Republicans had only a 1% edge in terms of the generic uh, ballot in terms of polling. So that could mean that the forecasting models are overestimating how well the Republicans will do. Uh, this doesn't look like a 52-48 split. It looks more like it might be 51-49, even closer uh, in terms of the national vote. That would cut down on Republican gains in the House. Uh, and another reason um, that uh, Democrats might not lose as many seats as uh, the in party normally does is because it has such a narrow majority right now in the House. As you know, it's a 10 seat majority. Uh, but you know, when you have a 50 seat majority, In the past, uh, in terms of the House, uh, then uh, the, usually the uh, the loss has been uh, less substantial than when uh, the majority party has a has a big advantage in the House. And there's a third reason why the uh, forecasting model, surge in decline, and uh, referendum might overestimate this time Republican gains, uh, and that's what we call the enthusiasm gap. Uh, and this is the gap in the eagerness uh, of one party's identifiers to vote compared 
with those who identify with the other party. Uh, and we kind of use that as an indicator of likely turnout. Uh, are the followers of one party more likely than the others to show up at, up at the polls in the midterms? Uh, and of course, in a lower turnout election, like a midterm, you know, turnout really becomes important. Uh, so pollsters use the enthusiasm gap as the surrogate for uh, interest in, uh, in showing up uh, in the, uh, at the polls. And <clears throat> when you look at this over recent elections, uh, what you see is almost always, uh, and by a significant margin in some cases, uh, the out parties voters are more inclined to say they really want to get to the polls than those of the in party. Uh, so not only do you have those other factors working against the in party, but uh, the out parties followers, the identifiers uh, are more activated. Uh, they're probably more dissatisfied than the in parties voters are satisfied and therefore they're more likely to want to show up at the polls and register that view. Um, but here's 2022. Um, but again, you see an advantage. Republicans somewhat more likely to say that they want to turn out in the election, but it's by a smaller margin than is normally the case. So that again could cut down on the number of seats uh, that Republicans gain in the House of Representatives. Uh, and again, we see a large change uh, between early in the year and now. So early in the year, there was a huge enthusiasm gap in favor of Republicans, much more likely to say they were anxious to vote in the November election than Democrats. It's narrowed. Uh, so what's going on here? Well. Dobbs, for sure, uh, the Supreme Court decision, uh, that gap narrowed within a few weeks after Dobbs. That certainly activated the Democratic base. Uh, and perhaps, uh, uh, although I think it's a bit inconclusive, uh, perhaps the January 6 hearings helped energize Democrats uh, in terms of thinking about, I really want to get out and vote in this election. So here's the main obstacle uh, to Democrats keeping their losses at a relatively small number. Uh, and this is, they're working against a big headwind here, uh, a bad economy. Uh, what I've done here is to take every uh, midterm election since 1982 uh, and show you what the in party's losses were uh, when the economy was good and when it's bad. Uh, and you can see it's much harder for the in party to do well. Uh, when the economy is 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 not doing well. Uh, in, in fact, there's a huge difference between the two. And of course, this election, uh, the economy is struggling. Um, I had dinner last night with a Democratic pollster, and uh, she said that the biggest problem they're having uh, is that, uh, you know, the economy is really working against them, that higher gas prices, higher grocery bills, uh, these things are really hurting them in terms of trying to win uh, the swing vote. Um, and um, if you look at independence uh, from where most of the swing votes will come uh, on Tuesday, uh, about half of them uh, place the economy as the top issue of this election. And then when you look at uh, how independents respond to that generic ballot, are you going to vote Democratic or Republican? Right now, they're breaking about 53, 47 Republican. Uh, and that will spell the difference because both Democratic and Republican identifiers are going to come pretty close uh, to staying home uh, in this election. The reality here is Democrats want to hold on to that 50-50 de facto majority in the Senate. Uh, they don't win, need to win most of these races. No, they only need to win 14 of them. That will get them and keep them at that magic number of, uh, of 50. So here's, as of yesterday, um, how the Cook political report uh, uh, rates uh, the various uh, Senate races. So. Um, puts a number of them in the solid or likely Republican category, number in the solid or likely Democratic category, and then we've got nine uh, Senate races that are 
either leaning uh, narrowly Republican or narrowly Democratic or considered to be toss-ups. So if we start by conceding to the Democrats those nine solid or likely seats, uh, they still need five more. Uh, so can they get them uh, out of the nine seats that are uh, kind of at least somewhat up for grabs? Um, so here are the races, uh, those nine races that seem to be at least somewhat up for grabs. Uh, the lean Democratic ones are the ones in New Hampshire and Colorado, uh, lean Republican. Uh, we've got uh, North, oops, I'm sorry, excuse me. We've got North Carolina and Ohio, and then we've got the toss-ups. So what I've done uh, was to go back and look at what the polls suggest, the, 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 the polls specifically about these races as to who's likely to win them. And I first went back to March. Uh, and again, uh, that was the point that I made earlier about my, March. Republicans had the enthusiasm gap in their favor uh, in the generic vote nationally. They were up clearly on the Democrats. Uh, if the Senate elections had been held in March, and if we could trust the polls, uh, then this was almost certainly going to be uh, a Senate majority uh, come 2023. But we're in early November, and the latest poll suggests that uh, Democrats are going to win in two of these. Again, if we take the polls at face value, uh, two, two, two will go Democratic. That's the Arizona and Colorado seats. That will get the Democrats up to 11. Uh, and then they'll have to win all three of those two close to call ones to get that magic number of 14, unless they can win one of those that momentarily, at least according to the polls, look like it's going to go Republican. So it's a tough road for the Democrats. Uh, they're gonna have to really do well uh, in those two close to call races in Georgia, New Hampshire, and Pennsylvania. Uh, so what happened between March and October to at least give Democrats a shot at holding on to their Senate majority. Uh, again, I would list Dobbs. Uh, and then in some ways, Republicans have, have really put themselves at risk in this election uh, because there were a number of these Senate races that they were clearly favored to win. And they came up with weak candidates uh, like Walker in Georgia and Oz in Pennsylvania, uh, J.D. Vance in Ohio and so on. Uh, now. What was interesting about all five of these uh, who Mitch McConnell said are very weak candidates, so I'm not just my word for it, but uh, all of those were Trump-backed candidates in the GOP primaries. Uh, and they beat uh, uh, a Republican uh, opponent who was somewhat close to the center of the political spectrum. Um, and it was, it's these nominees uh, that have given the Democrats a chance of uh, holding on to their Senate majority. Uh, and if they do, I think we'll go back and say, oh, this is like 2010 and 2012, where Republicans also shot themselves in the foot. In that case, it was because of Tea Party-backed uh, primary uh, candidates uh, that were deeply flawed. Uh, Christine O'Donnell in Delaware, for example, uh, uh, with her interest in witches and talking about witches and the like, it, it, it killed that Senate race for the Republicans, even though they were early on favored to win it. We could see the same thing happening again this time, that it uh, basically was a inter, that factional fight within the Republican Party uh, that ruined their chances of, of winning uh, the uh, control of the Senate. Um, now, on the other hand, um, some of you may know that polls in recent elections have tended to underestimate uh, the Republican vote. If that's so, then the chart I showed you earlier, uh, it may be that some of those toss-up races really are in the Republican category already. Uh, uh, also, Republicans have been picking up ground uh, these last two weeks. And then there's what I call the luck factor. Uh, will one party or the other get lucky enough to win all these close races? And in that case, it will certainly uh, have control of the Senate. Uh, and you may dismiss that as a possibility, but I take you back to 1980. Uh, uh, it was in the 1980 uh, elections that the Republicans gained control of the Senate for the first time in 30 years. Uh, and they did it by being very lucky. Uh, there were seven Senate seats that were decided within a margin 
of 52-48 or less, uh, and Republicans won every one of those races. So it can happen, uh, and it actually could decide uh, the uh, control of the Senate this go around as well. We do have a lot of close races. Uh, let me speak briefly to two known unknowns, and then uh, I'll get out of the way here, and we'll get to your questions. Uh, so love Donald Rumsfeld's vocabulary, at least. Uh, and uh, so we got two known unknowns in 2022 that I think are important. So we know that redistricting matters, but we're not quite sure what the effect of redistricting will be until the votes are cast. Uh, and then we have a set of new ballot access laws that we know are probably going to affect who shows up and who can't on election day. But we don't know how big the impact of those laws will be. So <clears throat> here's the cumulative effect of redistricting. So this factors in all of the apportionment decisions that were made by state legislatures as a result of the redistricting that occurred after the 2020 census. Uh, and when you look at this chart, it looks pretty good for Democrats. Uh, 197 of the new seats uh, were won uh, rather comfortably by Biden in 2020. Uh, 178 pretty comfortably by Trump in 2020. And then we have these 60 districts in the middle and they actually split uh, 30 uh, went Biden and 30 went Trump. Uh, and those are districts, uh, the new districts that uh, were 54, 46 or less uh, in terms of the 2020. Uh, presidential vote. Now that looks pretty good for Democrats. But here's some reasons why those numbers aren't quite so favorable to the Democratic side. So um, as it happens, uh, I don't break it out for you, but the lean Biden districts are actually closer to 51-49, where the lean Trump ones on average are closer to 52-48. So the Biden districts are more competitive in when you have a really close election, uh, those are the, the seats you worry about. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the Brennan Center uh, did uh, created the numbers in, in the chart I just showed you, but they chose to do it on the basis of the presidential vote. Uh, mm -hmm. And some of you certainly know that Trump ran behind uh, Republican congressional candidates in 2020. He did less well against Biden than Republican congressional candidates did against their Democratic congressional opponents. Uh, if they had used those numbers instead of the presidential numbers, that would have looked a little more favorable to the Republicans. And then the other thing is something we've already talked about, surge and decline. Biden's numbers in 2020 were boosted by those voters who showed up in 2020, but won't be here uh, for the 2022 midterms. So again, you get an elevated uh, estimate of uh, what those districts look like in terms of their competitive balance. Now, ballot access. Um, what we do know, this is the known of the unknown, is that roughly 30 Republican-controlled states since the 2020 election have passed laws tightening access to the ballot. Uh, and they were precisely targeted. And they were targeted for a reason. So Here's the 2020 presidential vote by how people cast their ballot. And there's a really stark contrast here that you will note. Uh, among those who voted by mail or absentee, uh, Biden won that group by almost two to one. The in-person voters went three to two Trump. And the Republican laws have targeted, uh, put restrictions on mail and absentee balloting. Under the assumption, of course, that uh, that's the way that Democrats uh, are likely to vote. And if you can make that more difficult, uh, it's going to cost the Democrats some vote, votes in the midterm. Um, so that's an unknown, though, as to how big that uh, loss will be. But here's what we do know. And to create this chart, uh, I have on the vertical axis, uh, I've ranked the states from the state that has the lowest turnout, that happens to be uh, Oklahoma. Uh, to the state that has the highest turnout. Uh, and that happens to be my home state of Minnesota. Uh, but then on the horizontal axis, I've ranked the states by uh, the barriers that they place in front of voters, how easy or how hard it is for voters to cast a ballot. So for example, on the lowest end there would be my home state again of Minnesota, 
which allows for same day registration. Even if you're not registered, you can walk into the polling place, register on the spot, go to another booth, cast a ballot. Then on the other end of the scale, more difficult is Texas. Uh, um, and uh, states toward that end of the scale tend to close their uh, registration rolls down three to four weeks uh, before election day. Uh, so that's an example of easy versus hard. And as you can see clearly, uh, there's a relationship between the two. The easier a state makes it for people to vote, the higher their turnout uh, tends to be. Uh, so we can make an assumption that those ballot access laws passed since 2020 will make a difference. Uh, we're just not sure yet, won't know until after the election, how big a difference that made. So I'm gonna stop with this one, looking ahead to 2024. So the question here, uh, we know that uh, a presidential election is predictive of the upcoming midterm. Uh, you know, if you win the presidential election, you're likely to lose the midterm that follows. Uh, and the question here is whether it works the other way. Uh, are we gonna be able to tell anything from 2024 simply statistically by looking at what happens in 2022? And the answer is midterms are not very predictive of what happens two years later. Uh, it's almost a dead heat if we look at all of the post-World War II uh, presidential elections. The uh, winner of the midterm won 10 times, but lost nine times. So thank you. Uh, let me stop there. Questions, observations, objections. I, I got my internet unstable message a couple of times. I don't know whether you lost my audio briefly during those sessions or not, but uh, uh, I, I, I think the charts were self-explanatory in a way. So I, I don't think a great deal was lost, but thank you for listening. It just cut out maybe twice and not for very long. So yeah. it wasn't too bad. Yeah. At, least it, <laughs> um, at least it tells me when it's creating trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we do, so thank you. We do already have three questions. Um, so I'm going to try to allow people to ask it themselves. Um, so the first one is from Janice Barrett. Um, so Janice, I'm gonna allow you to unmute yourself. Hi, Janice. Janice is a, is a great friend of mine. So I hope this is a friendly question, Janice. All right. Hi, Tom. Hi, Janice. Thank you for an excellent presentation. I really appreciate oh, it. You. I just had a question. The focus now seems to be primarily on domestic issues. I wonder if there are any foreign policy issues like the support for Ukraine war that is having an influence on these elections? So do you think it's primarily the domestic policy issues? I think it's almost solely about domestic politics. If you look at the, uh, I just looked this morning at uh, the kind of the rank order of the issues, uh, the economy, abortion, uh, race, uh, not race, crime, immigration, race relations. Uh, uh, None of the top five uh, deal with foreign policy. Now there's some connections you can make, obviously. The, uh, you know, this economy in some ways uh, mirrors what's happening elsewhere, but uh, that connection is not being made clearly to the American voters. So I, I think they're thinking about this in terms of their own lives. Uh, what happens when they pull up at the pumps at the gas station and, and so on. So uh, I do think this is quite narrowly about domestic issues. Uh, but that's not unusual for a midterm. Uh, a midterm tends to be much more of a combination of uh, real strong emphasis on domestic issues, but then kind of also more on local concerns uh, as well as national concerns. Uh, one of the things that happens during the presidential election, because there's so much attention paid to the presidential candidates, and they have a, you know, they have a foreign policy portfolio as well as a domestic policy portfolio. Uh, they talk out some, at least, about foreign policy as well as domestic policy. And that that kind of brings that set of issues into the mix. But um, most congressional candidates uh, don't see an advantage to that. I was trying to look the other day in terms of uh, areas of the country where uh, you have large Ukrainian and more generally large Eastern European uh, populations, at least in terms of 
the old patterns of immigration. I just couldn't find anything uh, that would tell me even whether that issue is resonating uh, in this election for those uh, for those Americans. Thank you. Great. Um, and then we have another question from Maxine Isaacs. Hi, Tom. Hi, Maxine. I haven't seen you in a while. How are you? Oh, I miss you. Um, I, I, it was a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm interested in the in the question of salience to the voters as a factor in this election. So that they, whether they're saying different things, they always say economy, as you know, in every election because that's what they think the government can can do yeah. something about. But but whether they're actually turning out because of Dobbs or threats to democracy or exhaustion with the political debate, you know, something else. Um, is, is that just not st statistically significant or is it immeasur unmeasurable or uh, is it not a factor? So um, Maxine and I go back some ways. Um, the uh, Maxine was at the Shorenstein Center for a long stretch and uh, I miss her not being there uh, regularly. But um, this was a question, uh, Maxine, that I asked uh, my friend, the Democratic pollster last night over dinner as to um, kind of how much verbal um okay. you've cut out <laughs> let's see if we can get him back soon oh tom i think he might be back now can you hear me yep go okay. ahead so I, let me start that over again. Um, so uh, I think all of you heard Maxine's question. Uh, so um, <clears throat> the that was a question, incidentally, that I asked the the Democratic poster that I had dinner with last night as to uh, how much of this is kind of just verbal rationalization, how much is real in terms of what uh, people say is bothering them. Uh, and her response was that, uh, she thought Republicans and Democrats, the diehards, had really kind of settled on issues that justified just staying home, right? So uh, with Democrats talking about things like uh, abortion and uh, race relations and uh, immigration and so on, Republicans talking about the economy and crime and, and the like. Uh, but she said, when you talk to the independents, uh, and again, uh, she, she sees them as, as really the critical vote on Tuesday. Uh, in talking with the independents, this is very much uh, at the top of their agenda for most of them. Uh, they are concerned uh, about pocketbook issues. Um, and uh, and she said, we're really losing those voters. Those are the independents we're not being able to pull in. Um, the independents that are concerned about abortion, disproportionately, uh, they're going to Democratic. Uh, but, um, you know, the um, there's a reality to inflation. Uh, you know, even with unemployment, if you think about unemployment, uh, most of us still have jobs, right? So uh, you know, we can talk about it as an issue, but um, unemployment is less felt by fewer people than than inflation, particularly when it gets up to into this range. You know, when you start paying this much for gas and this much for milk and so on. So I think it's a real issue. But uh, you know, we're so polarized, Maxine, that uh, it takes a lot to move a Democrat into the Republican column or a Republican into the Democratic column. So we're really talking for the most part in, and the parties, and the two parties are very closely uh, competitive, uh, almost as many uh, followers on each side. So the independents then come into play and uh, and uh, the polling that they were doing in these, in some of these key races, she said, uh, you know, it, it's, it's killing us. Uh, you know, we, we could beat them <laughs> if, if, if somehow we weren't going against uh, this inflation headwind. Thank you very much. It's fascinating. Thank you. And she was talking about races like Georgia and uh, Arizona and the, the toss-up races, uh, mm -hmm. which she was convinced, you know, they would, Democrats would have been able to hold on to the Senate, but uh, the, or even if um, maybe, you know, if the Supreme Court's term ran from uh, uh, September to September, <laughs> Democrats might have been better off, right? So 
you know, some of the energy uh, that came after the Dobbs decision, uh, you know, that that's just going to gradually, the half, every influence has a half-life. And uh, so that's a little bit less on people's minds uh, at the moment than it was in the immediate aftermath of the decision. So that's less of a driver. And, uh, you know, so timing matters as well. Great. And our next question is going to be from Oren Adam. Hey there, can you guys hear me? Yep. All right. Uh, so my question was um, specifically focusing on, and I'm curious, you know, what impact, if any, these competitive governor's races would have on the midterm races. So I'm thinking specifically of Arizona, Georgia, Nevada and Pennsylvania, do you think uh, this will effectively make up for some of the issues of, you know, as you talked about the decline traditionally in midterms, particularly given some of the not so great recruiting on the Republican front? Um, interested in, in hearing your thoughts generally. Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, we probably won't know the answer to that or until after the election. Uh, there's been a rise in straight ticket voting uh, and it's been pretty steady over the last 20 years. Uh, so, and that might suggest that in Georgia, for example, it, it's pretty clear that, uh, unless the polls are really off, that uh, that Kemp is gonna defeat uh, Abrams in Georgia. Uh, will that be enough? Uh, will there be enough kind of people to start at the top of the ticket and when they get to the, uh, the Senate race, kind of stay in that column just because uh, that's where they start, and that's kind of where they generally think of themselves as being. So I would think that might be the case in the New Hampshire races, uh, uh, Georgia. Uh, when you get out into um, Arizona, Nevada, I'm not quite so sure what we're dealing with there. I, I follow those races a little bit less closely. They're also pretty closely contested, so uh, I'm a little bit less sure about whether there's kind of a coattail effect. Uh, that we'll see in those. But, you know, when you get a toss-up election, you, even move, moving a quarter of a percent, a half a percent of the vote, that's that's a big deal uh, when you have virtually a de dead heat. Um, when, uh, and that's why I talked about the luck factor, right? <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, these these are some of these races are 50-50, and uh, you have enough 50-50, you toss heads and tails enough, some are going to come up heads, some are going to come up tails, and uh, you just hate to be the party uh, that gets the tails every time in, in one of these elections. It can happen. Makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Great. So we have um, four people in the queue. Um, the next person with the question is Martin um, Burkhar. Oh, OK. Are you there? Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Oh, OK. Hi, Tom. It's Martin. Hi, Martin. Good to see you. Um, yeah, I'd written down my question because I wasn't sure I could get, get access to the video. Um, but here, here's a question. Um, we know it's hard in a midterm election for the parties to gather around one theme. Uh, don't you think that both the Democrats and the Republicans had a problem this time around conveying what they would actually like to do if they gain majority in Congress? And one thing, of course, is to say you are against Dobbs versus Mississippi and other what you're actually going to do about it and not, you know and that's that's for the Democrats and for the Republicans one thing is being against inflation but another thing is what are you going to do about it so that's the first question I have a follow-up well uh, Martin is a journalist so uh, the complicated question that you just asked I, I think is reflects his background to some extent that, that's, that's a tough question I think um my sense is that the Republicans do messaging better than Democrats generally, and probably have done a better job of it um, in this uh, midterm than Democrats. Um, you know, if you think about crime, for example, uh, as an issue, uh, you know, what they've done successfully is to raise the issue uh, without talking much at all about what they would do about it or the root causes. Uh, I think they get some help here, by the way, from journalists from the news media, because uh, if you look at the stories about crime helping Republican candidates, in the con it's in the context of the polls, uh, you know, Democrats on the defensive about crime. Well, you know, 
voters and tend to conflate these things. Uh, you know, so does that mean that Democrats are bad on crime and Republicans are good on crime, uh, as opposed to drilling down? So um, I think it's I think it's a hard it's been a harder row in some ways for Democrats as it is almost always for incumbents. So I think uh, abortion was the one issue uh, that they could really address uh, in a in a frontal way uh, and make the connections right. And uh, the economy is really tough. I think if you're the in party and it's and it's not doing well uh, because there's so much of that of the economy you don't really own in the sense that there's nothing you can really do about it. But you can't kind of go out there and say, it's not my fault, that doesn't work. So um, I think you're in an inherently weak position um, as the uh, as the end party when the economy is struggling. Um, and again, I go back to that one chart uh, that shows just how much more uh, advantage a weak economy gives the out party. Uh, uh, during a midterm election. So, and I think part of that is just very difficult uh, if you're the end party uh, to say, you know, if, if you can do these things, why is it so bad? You know, and, and you can't simply pass the buck. You can't, I don't think it would be effective for the, would have been effective for Democrats to say, this is a supply side problem uh, over and over and over again. Um, it may be true that a large part of our inflationary problem is due to um, you know, the supply chain uh, being disrupted, but uh, that doesn't help very much when people are really thinking about how much their groceries cost and the like. So you could say it, but I, I think it would pretty much fall on deaf ears. So I just think it's a really tough, tough thing. And I wish we would kind of hold candidates more accountable, which is the implicit part of your question about how do, how do they get away with it, simply raising these issues? without right. talking very much about what they're gonna do about them. Uh, and there, I think uh, it's incumbent on the other party to point that out, but I think that's also uh, part of the role of the press uh, to help us navigate uh, those differences, but um, we don't get very much help uh, uh, on either front. A follow-up question, if I'm allowed to do that. Um, you said early on, at, at the very end of your uh, presentation, which I thought was amazingly good, um, that probably there would be no impact of these congressional elections on the 2020, 2024 election. Well, I've been thinking for a while that, you know, if all of or most of Trump's candidates win, then that seems to be a pretty clear indication that he's going to run and he's going to do probably okay. Whereas, you know, in reverse, if they don't do that very well, these Trump uh, loyalists, then he might not even run. So that was a statistical comment just about the predictive uh, ability of uh, of the midterms to predict the next presidential election. So uh, it's not very predictive, unlike uh, uh, we know that the midterms are much more predictive. So that was the point of that. But um, I think Trump's going to run anyway. Um, and um, uh, whether his nominees win or not, um, for all sorts of reasons, uh, I think the Democrats, uh, they probably aren't saying it publicly. I, I think they hope that uh, Trump runs and gets the Republican nomination. If you look at the trial heat polls, uh, he's the one Republican moment uh, candidate that, at the moment that uh, Biden could possibly beat if Biden were to run for reelection. Now, a lot can happen between mm -hmm. now and, and 2024. And I think that's the reason why these Elections are not always so predictive, but you know, if I were, if you think about Biden, for example, uh, and you can you can come up with two scenarios about Joe Biden. Uh, one is the Ronald Reagan scenario, um, and that is that uh, Reagan had a tough time in the '82 midterm, uh, but in '83, '84, uh, the economy started to rebound, and by '84, Reagan could say "Morning in America" and wins re-election. Uh, Maxine asked to. Uh, a question earlier. Uh, she worked for Walter Mondale. Uh, that was that was tough going running against uh, where the economy was in '84. Or Biden could be like Jimmy Carter. Uh, so Democrats had a tough midterm in '78, uh, and uh, the economy just got worse in '79 and didn't improve all that much in in '80. And then you had the Iranian hostage crisis thrown into that, and uh, there you are looking at a one-term president. So I think you can do kind of game two scenarios when it comes to Joe Biden. Um, 
-hmm. with Donald Trump, uh, he's going to carry more and more baggage coming into 2024. I'm not sure it's going to hurt him in terms of trying to get the Republican nomination, although I do think he will have uh, opponents, uh, including some who are saying much the same thing that he's saying. They think, they think he's vulnerable because of uh, the baggage he's carrying. But I think for Democrats, uh, they would love to run against Trump. Uh, and uh, the irony, of course, is if a Republican has to get elected, Trump is the last one <laughs> they'd like to see elected. So uh, their political self-interest and their governing self-interest may be in conflict there. Right. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Martin, hope to see you one of these days. I'm in Princeton, so uh, yeah, uh, with Eva. Uh, so I'm I'm going to be back next summer. Okay. So I'll see you then. We'll catch up. Yeah. Okay. The next question is going to be from Mary Ellen uh, Class, um, and I'm going to unmute you right now. Great. Thanks so much. I am a uh, reporter in Florida with the Miami Herald, and um, one of the things you talked about is is kind of the local nature of of some of these state races. But in Florida, it, you know, we've got a governor's race, and it looks like it's going to be a red wave. Um, and the incumbent has all but ignores state issues, like we've got a pending insurance crisis and housing affordability, rising utility rates, things like that. Um, but he's really been successful at, at nationalizing the issues. Um, obviously inflation and focus on culture wars. And I'm trying to, I'm just wondering, um, I have not looked at other states and I'm wondering if you have a sense if this is uh, unique to Florida or if this, if these nationalizing of the debate is pretty common elsewhere. Yeah, there's, there's been, there's a wonderful book uh, about the nationalization of American politics. So, um, you know, the, our politics is less local and more national increasingly. So more and more of the issues that dominate uh, the national scene play down at the local level, and even to the school board level. Uh, right. We're seeing some of these things play out. So um, we've seen that tendency. I do think uh, Florida this year uh, is probably the extreme version of that. Uh, and I think to some degree, uh, two things factor into that and have made it uh, such. So um, one is that DeSantis has had a fairly comfortable lead uh, in the governor's race. Uh, you know, pre-hurricane, things got looked like they were getting a little shaky, but uh, not all that shaky. And then, as you know, he was sitting on that huge uh, war chest. <laughs> Uh, so that if he needed to kick it in, he could. Uh, so I think he had the luxury uh, of basically uh, setting himself up for a run for the presidency in 2024, should he decide to do it, or if he decides not to, uh, using his campaign there as a platform to speak to Russian, uh, to Republicans nationally, uh, as well as uh, in, in Florida. So I think he was unusually positioned that uh, led to an exaggeration of what has become uh, the tendency. Um, the I know less about the Senate race, uh, partly because it's gotten less press attention, interestingly. Um, and uh, so I don't know the degree to which um, kind of Rubio has uh, kind of played that same tune. Although as a member of the Senate, of course, you'd expect him uh, to speak uh, substantially to national issues as well as those of Florida. I have one other question, and this may be something for another webinar, which maybe you would consider. Um, and that is just the how much of the rise in nationalization of our politics is a result or contributing a contributing factor is Apologies, Mary Ellen. I think I accidentally, sorry. <laughs> Could you repeat your follow-up question? Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. That was my fault. <laughs> well, I just, I said, this this may be another issue for another webinar because um, it's something I'm, I'm very interested in. And that is how much is the result of the rise in nationalized, nationalization of politics? How much um, has the decline in local journalism contributed to that? Where people are now, Net less focused um, because they hear less about what's happening locally, 
Uh, and now everything is attuned to what's happening at the national level. I'm just wondering if there's, if that's something you have a, a thoughts on or if there is any research relating to that. I haven't seen, uh, well, I shouldn't say I haven't seen. There's a little bit in the book that I, um, uh, by uh, Nan Hopkins uh, about nationalization. There's a, there's a piece in there about the decline in local journalism uh, and local reporting, attention to local issues and how that's contributing uh, to this tendency. But uh, he would make the argument as I would, that it's it's a smaller influence than other things. Uh, I think what's happened to, the main reason for the nationalization um, is we've lost a lot of diversity within our two political parties. So if you go back to my youth, uh, we really had uh, robust wings in each party. There was the Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats. On the Republican side, we had the uh, the conservatives and the progressives. Uh, but uh, if you look at the Republican Party today, the progressive wing is very much diminished. And of course, you look at the Democratic Party today, and uh, you know, Southern Democrats are not <laughs> are not a large part of that. They're they're now Southern Republicans. That region's Republican rather than Democratic. And what this has done is to make the parties more ideological, ideologically coherent, uh, making the Republican Party more uniformly conservative. Uh, the Democratic Party more uniformly progressive or liberal, whichever of those terms you prefer. Uh, that's made it easier for people in different parts of the country to coalesce around the same issues and the same priorities for those issues. Uh, and it's that kind of merging uh, of opinion uh, that's uh, allowed nationalization to kind of then work its way down because the issues uh, um, of national politics uh, and they almost always have a local dimension, but because there isn't kind of much disagreement within the parties about how that would be responded to locally, uh, that's made the, the national, or at least the appearance of the national voice much more prominent. But I, I think your 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 general topic uh, would be a great webinar uh, that we should do at some point. Uh, kind of all of the uh, factors uh, that um, have been influenced, all the things about politics, how we think about it, um, what happens in our communities as a result of the decline of, uh, of local journalism, the newspaper particularly. Great, thank you. So Caroline, I think you're muted. Oh. Yep, I am. Sorry. <laughs> so we did have one other question, but let me. OK, so the next question is from Bill Denser. Uh, thanks, Caroline, and thank you, Professor, for this uh, webinar. My question is about polling. A lot's been said uh, during this cycle about the accuracy and the challenges of polling this year. And I'm wondering what your view is on that, if you think it's different this year, if at all, and, and how that might uh, potentially affect outcomes uh, nationwide? So, uh, you know, it's a good question, Bill. I, and, you know, one of the things about polls is it's always a great topic after the election because then we have some actual results to compare with the uh, with the poll projections. Uh, you know, the pollsters are, are mindful of the fact that they've been, uh, the last couple of elections, they've been kind of underestimating the Republican vote. Um, and uh, the... And they've tried to build some of that into their their modeling. So, you know, when they do the polls, they never give us the raw numbers. Uh, they always adjust the raw numbers for kind of known indicators, uh, demographic distributions and the like. Uh, uh, some of them have now put in a corrective around party. So uh, I think we'll just see uh, after the election. Uh, it's polling is getting tougher and tougher. Uh, and uh, what we do know is Republicans are more likely to refuse uh, when they're contacted by a pollster than our Democrats. Uh, and uh, they're not the only group. Uh, and then across the board, uh, Americans are increasingly likely to say no, uh, in part because we're inundated with uh, robocalls and uh, we conflate uh, uh, people who are calling with a legitimate reason for asking us questions with uh, those that are trying to sell us something. So it's gotten harder to be a pollster in America. And uh, 
you know, they, they, they're, they're, I think they're doing amazingly well, given all of the issues that they, that they face in trying to reach people and reconstruct something into uh, what looks like what they think is a representative sample, and then basically putting their reputations on the line by putting those uh, results out. Uh, and then unlike some of us who are prog prognosticators who never get tested, uh, you know, they're tested pretty thoroughly on election day and pilloried if they missed uh, if they missed the mark. So um, I admire what they do. Um, and uh, I just wish that they didn't get so much attention in the election coverage. Uh, you know, election coverage increasingly is poll after poll after poll. Um, and, you know, there's only so much space and time. And um, that pushes the issues and discussion of the issues. Uh, one reason this goes back to Martin's question, making these connections between what the candidates are saying and whether they have any solution in mind in uh, in, in their criticisms or their claims uh, is we're getting less and less of, of news coverage of those things and uh, and therefore uh, the public is less attentive to it, uh, less attuned um, and probably less informed about uh, what the candidates would do as opposed to what the candidates are claiming. Great, thanks so much. So, Professor Patterson, we do have one more question. It's from Denise Ordway. She's with the Journalist Resource at the Shorenstein Center. Um, and she's, uh, her voice is going out, so I'm gonna ask it for her. So um, she said she finds it interesting that both conservatives and liberals have shown support for ballot measure issues that traditionally have been liberal issues, such as rec recreational marijuana legalization. Um, and yet they still tend to elect legislators and other representatives along party lines. Why is this and what does it mean for American politics in the future? Well, uh, Denise, that's an interesting question. I mean, the, uh, there are some of these things that are very popular, like uh, legalized marijuana. But, but actually, if you look across the states uh, that have um, enacted uh, or been willing to put on the ballot, uh, legalized marijuana, uh, it, there's a clear pattern there. Uh, you're much more likely to see that in a blue state than in a red state. So that, um, yeah, I mean, there are some issues where the differences between Republicans and Democrats uh, narrow, but uh, when it comes to actually putting it into law, uh, there's, a, there's a significant difference around marijuana. And then of course, when you start thinking about initiatives, uh, you know, that's not controlled by the lawmakers. That's that's in the hands of citizens. So um, in a lot of states, um, it's the citizens rather than the Republican or Democratic leaders that are pushing the issue. Um, and, uh, you know, and we're increasingly seeing that around uh, uh, legalized uh, use of recreational marijuana. But I think if, and if the timing had been different, if let's say the uh, Dobbs decision had come down last year rather than this year, I think we would see quite a few more states this year uh, that had um, abortion uh, on the ballot uh, as a citizen for a citizen's vote. Uh, we saw that, by the way, in the early 2000s on the Republican side around same sex marriage, where in one of the elections, I don't remember exactly whether it was a midterm or presidential year, I think it was a midterm, uh, there were eight, nine, or 10. Uh, uh, Republican uh, states where they uh, put uh, opposite sex marriage as the only legal form of marriage on the ballot. And it was put on there pretty clearly uh, uh, to increase the turnout. And uh, I think Democrats, if they'd had more time, probably would have pursued that strategy around uh, abortion rights this time. Well, that is it for questions. Um, thank you again, Tom. Um, and we're headed for an exciting week. <laughs> well, thanks, Caroline, for doing this. And thank all of you for, for joining us. And uh, I want to keep in mind that uh, local media question I, and whether we should do something subsequently on that. I think it's a fascinating question we should do. It's an important question. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody.